to, I'm going to uh, spend a little bit more time on the topic that we were in last week, uh, which is we were talk at the end of the at the end of the lesson we were talking about sin and how our sin, you know, affects us. Of course, the the, new, the sin nature was passed on to us from Adam and Eve. We have this sin nature, and how does it affect us? And then how does our sin? affect us, meaning our attitudes, meaning our feelings, meaning who we are. And I'm going to stay there. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, repeat anything from last week, but, but that topic we're going to stay on for one more week because I believe, I believe that this is one of the biggest reasons why people, why churches in America grow cold, why churches in America become apathetic toward God, toward the things of God, because they first grow cold in their attitude toward their sin. I believe that. I believe that we get apathetic. The people in our churches get apathetic about their sin. Our sin put Jesus Christ on the what? Cross. He had no sin, right? He had no sin, and we had no righteousness. So that doctrine of imputation comes into play. He dies for us. He purchased salvation. His righteousness was, was put on our account. All of our sins and the sins of the world, world were put on His account that day as He paid the sin debt. And the, what do we do in America? We're, we're cold. Just at, just as American churches, cold. We have prayer meetings, you know, and we have we have prayer meetings on Thursdays. The ladies meet at one o'clock, and five or six people will show up. We have prayer meetings on um, when, or Tuesday night at uh, at five thirty for men men's prayer meeting, and you know four or five will show up. That, that's the best. I mean that that's the best. Four or five people. So, um, I got to be honest, folks. Like many churches, just many, many churches. This is a rhetorical question, so don't answer it. But do you consider our church as a praying church? A praying church means that many people gather together and pray. Yeah, we have a praying church. But when just... Now look, you might say, well, hey, we're two or three to gather, gather together in my name. There I am in the midst of them. Agreed. Agreed. But let me read you... Let me read you... Well, I won't read it for you. I'm going to do that during prayer. Anyway, so... But why is that? Why, why are most churches these days... Not praying churches. You, you know, why do we not shed tears over the lost? Why do we not shed tears over our lost family members? Why do we not shed tears over, over the fact that, over the fact that, that, that our sin put Jesus Christ on the cross? Uh, the Lamb of God. Remember that song? The Lamb of God, no sin to hide. Something like, I may not get it all right, but, but, but he was sent. Oh, boy, I'm not going to get any of it right now. Something about being sent from the Father's side to walk upon this guilty side and to become the Lamb of God. Do you think, does our, is our sin Offensive to God? Absolutely. Offensive. Yet Jesus came down and walked among us and he saw the very worst of it. Which probably was in the lives of the Pharisees. Did you think that? When I said the worst of it, did you think first the drunkards and the drug addicts and the prostitutes and the, you know, the wife beaters and the... Is that what you thought? Or did you think... 
the proud and arrogant religious leaders that are leading people to hell. That's the only group that Jesus says, Woe unto you, ye scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. He never said, Woe unto you, you drunkards and whoremongers and fornicators. I'm not saying that, that, that that's, you know, sin is, uh, sin is sin. But why doesn't it affect us? Why do we want to live right up next to it? Why do we want to say, well, the Bible says I shouldn't do that, so, but I can do every bit of this. Yeah, I'm right on the line of that carpet. I can do every bit of that. I just can't step over. Why is that our attitude? And then if we do step over, it's kind of like, oh, well, okay. I know it's sin, but, but my sins have been paid for. I said this last week. I need to get going. I'm very passionate about this, this truth right here, this topic, though. Let's look at what happened in the garden after the first sin. What were the, what were the initial actions of the first sinners, Adam and Eve? We can, probably, we can probably see their first actions in us as we sin. A, Adam and Eve ran from the presence of God. Yes? Okay? They, they fled the presence of God. They fled wherever it was that... That they met with God in, uh, you know, in the morning, in that cool of the day. It could have been in the evening. It it's, doesn't matter. I tend to think it might have been in the morning when, when God would meet with them. And I think they had a place. It doesn't say that, but i got to imagine that, uh, that to, to fellowship with God probably had a, a place. Like we have a place. We gather together. And they fled that place and they went out and hid in the woods, the Bible says. Hid amongst the trees. They heard the voice of God, and they fled the voice of God, and they hid amongst the trees. This is what sin does in our lives when, when, we, are, when we are apathetic about it. Now, now, they were not, okay? I'll give you that. Adam and Eve were not. They were frightened. They were scared. They fled, they fled God because they were so scared of God that they had broken His law. Do we... Do we do we have that same fear? Not in fear as in, you know, we're going to sin and God's going to send us to hell. No, you know that's not what I believe. Uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, I believe that. And, uh, and that's what we teach here. Um, but I do think that we're apathetic about it. I do think that we, 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 we turn our backs a little on God. As they fled from him out of fear, we kind of just turn our back on him and just say, oh, well, whatever. God called after them. And, and they, you know, because they weren't there, wherever they were to meet him, they weren't there. They fled just like Jonah fled from God. Just like Paul fled from God when, as Saul, as God was... Uh, uh, you know, dealing with him and pricking his heart. Saul just kept running from God, just as Peter did, just as Moses did, just as the prodigal son, uh, you know, left his father and, and, and took, his, uh, uh, took his riches and left, his wealth and left. And countless others in the scriptures did when they attempted to run from God. And our sin will drive us from God. And, and we don't necessarily run like Adam and Eve, but we do walk we do walk away as in as our sin goes unconfessed because we're just not that worried about it and we're not apath we're just apathetic and it doesn't matter that separates us from God just like it did Adam and Eve the remarkable difference between them and many church members is that they ran and hid while we arrogantly often Coming to the presence of God, wearing our fig leaves. Wearing this, you know, hey, God, uh, it's the Cain. It's the Cain attitude. Cain kills Abel, right? God comes down and says to Cain, where's your brother Abel? And he says, it's not my day to watch him. Arrogant. Arrogant. Um, disrespectful. What? What? Not my day. Am I my, my, my brother's keeper? That's what he said, right? That's what the Bible says. So what he's saying is, not my job to watch Abel. 
arrogant and disrespectful to God. And I believe that in the life of a Christian, when we have sin and our sin doesn't bother us and we continue in our sin, I believe, and, and then, and then we, we just go through day, day after day living like that in that arrogant attitude and apathetic attitude about our sin and it's disrespectful to God, just like Cain was. B, Adam and Eve ran from the presence of God. B, Adam and Eve hid themselves and their sin from God. It's the great cover-up in Genesis chapter 7. The Bible says, and, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed what kind of leaves? Fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Now, just as a side note, it's the, I'm not teaching now. I had a fig for the first time yesterday. You ever had a fig? I never had a fig. And uh, I was at mom and dad's, and, and mom said, I got some really great figs. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. And uh, she said, no, you really need to taste one. So I ate one, and then I thought, well, it, it's, it tastes a little like a peach to me. You know, we all have different taste buds. But I said, it tastes a little like a peach, and it's got the consistency of kind of a more soft peach. Okay, now I'm back to teaching. Here we are presented with the fig leaf factor, which appears today in many different forms. They said, we're naked and we've got to cover up. And they sewed fig leaves together. Now we know, uh, you know, those of us that know the Bible, we know that's a problem. That's a representation of man solving his sin problem. What does he do? He gets fig leaves. Now we'll talk about what God does later. But the fig leaf factor is this, finding a covering for your sin in Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam, Catholicism, Judaism, Seventh-day Adventism, Atheism, and all others that pretend to cover a man's sin and his lack of holiness and righteousness. They sewed fig leaves together. And they said, that, that, that'll fix it. And then when God comes on the scene, they, they flee from Him, and they hide not only themselves, but their solution. All of these other ways cover, uh, all of these other ways to cover our sin are condemned in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken, taken, us, have taken us away. Coincidentally, and not really, I just put that word in there. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. Jesus cursed a tree in the New Testament. What kind of tree was it? Fig tree. Fig tree. He saw the fig tree. He was hungry. The Bible says Jesus was hungry. He saw the fig tree. It had leaves on it. He walks up to it, and it has no fruit on it. And he said, curse. I'm going to pronounce a curse on you. Did Jesus do that? But really, now think about it. Did he do that just because he was hungry? He didn't do it because he was hungry at all. He fasted 40 days in the wilderness. He cursed the fig tree as a spiritual lesson. That fig tree that he cursed represented religions, worldly religions, in particular Judaism. He said, "My tree, basically, he said of the fig tree, this is a picture of, of God's people and, 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 and the religious beliefs of God's people. They flourish like they got all kinds of, they can help you in all the ways, but when you actually get involved with it, there's no fruit. You come there hungry and you leave there hungry. He was talking about the Jews. He was talking about his people and their religi re religiosity. So when he, when he cursed that tree, it was the spiritual lesson far more important was, you know, if, if, for, for religious institutions, any kind of any belief, if you, if you believe and if you say that you have fruit, then you need to produce fruit and you need to be, need to be able to help somebody. And I'm talking about with salvation, not just help somebody with a morsel of food. That's important. But we're talking about salvation here. And he, and he said, uh, curse it. The fact that they cover themselves with fig leaves 
In fact, that Jesus cursed the fig leaves uh, later, that fig tree. Those tie together. That's where the New Testament is working in unison with the Old Testament. Jesus said, Matthew 21, 19, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. How many people go to hell because they have put their faith in some belief system that is incapable of delivering their soul from eternal judgment? Sometimes people get, you know, we call it low-hanging fruit. You know, when we see somebody saved and, and they were just easily saved, uh, you know, much like Brandy uh, the other day, she was just so ready to fall. <laughs> you know, she was ready. Okay, well, what happened? What would have happened, you know, if, if Cloverhill Hill Baptist Church hadn't been in their lives what happened if somebody else came by the door and, and, and Nate saved, Nate squared away, he would never allow this to happen. But let's just say, there are people out there that are that, that the, the situations in life have brought them to a point where they're ready to believe in something. And if the Christian doesn't get there with the gospel, they may believe the Mormon that comes by next. Because they're ready. You know what I'm saying? They're ready to fall. And that's why it's, it's so important for us to get out and to knock on doors and, uh, and to give tracts out. You never know when you'll put that tract in the hand of somebody that says, this is what I've been looking for. This is, this is, this is what I've been looking for, the truth. Genesis 3.10, uh, they ran and hid. Now, this is where we're, we're still under that, the second point. Adam and Eve hid themselves in their, uh, and their sin from God. The great cover-up is what they did to cover themselves up, and, and that's faulty. Sin brings guilt, guilt brings shame, and shame compels the sinner to run and hide. Where do they run and hide? Behind the trees of indifference, uh, innocence, as in I've done no wrong, behind the trees of ignorance, behind the trees of indulgence. These are where people that are rejecting Christ go to find their peace. The very trees given to them for food have now been turned into barricades. God gave them all of these trees and said, eat of all of these trees in the garden. And what was a provision of God now became a, bar now became a barricade from God as they hid behind the trees. You know, there, there's a lot going on here in this story than just, you know, they hid behind the, behind the trees. No, yeah, they did that. But the spiritual implication is there that, that, they, and that they used the, the things that God had given them now as a barricade against him. And we do the same thing. We do the prosperity that God has, I'm sorry, we use the prosperity that God has given to this country as a shield against God. And I, thought, and I spent time on this last week, and I'm not, not going to go there again, uh, at least for long. Uh, we use it as a barricade as we reject God, and, and we use the very prosperity that He gave to our country as a defense mechanism. We see others in the Bible that hid their wrongdoing and paid a great price because of that first sin. Cain killed Abel. The Bible doesn't say he hid the body of, of, of Abel. Uh, but as Mark is thinking of this, you know, I, th I think that I suppose he probably did. Generally, when people kill other people, they, they hide them. They still do in this day and time. Moses killed the Egyptian and buried his body, did he not? In the sand, he hid the Egyptian that he killed. Achan stole the treasures from Jericho, and he did what with them under the floor of his tent? He hid them, buried them, he hid them. The unjust servant in the parable, Jesus' parable, the unjust servant, hid the master's money, hid it in the ground, dug a hole, put it, and he hid it. And he was rebuked. Sternly for that. Ananias and Sapphira hid the truth from the apostles, did they not? Hid the truth. They came in and we sold the land for this. And, and um, 
And of course the apostles said, uh, we don't think so. We think you're lying to the Holy Ghost. Boom. And Ananias falls dead. Sapphira comes in several hours later. See those men over there? Look at those men. They are the ones that carried your dead husband out of here just a few hours ago. And the same for you. And he killed them for hiding the truth. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that, and I mentioned this last week, He that covereth his sins shall not, what? Does anybody know? Prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Confesseth and forsaketh. We allow that sin, we, look, we allow the guilt to do its work in our hearts. That Holy Spirit that says, you are dead wrong now, and you need to get to God and get this thing right with God. Confess it. Take it to God and confess it. I'm sorry. You are right. I am totally wrong. We are in agreement on this matter. And, 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 and I'm so sorry, and I apologize for that. Confesseth and forsaketh. That means you confess a sin and then you walk away from it. I mean, you, you don't just go out and day after day after day, you know, thinking, well, I'll just go out and commit the same sin and I'll just go confess it. Ain't no big deal. I'll take a couple minutes out of my night tonight. Mm -mm. Now, God says you, you need to be forsaking it. You, 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 it doesn't mean that you, you, you'll never do it again. But it does mean that in your mind and in your heart, you're saying, I'm never doing that again. I'm forsaking that. And then sometimes we do fall. Sometimes we are, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we're, we're, we're addicted to some sin of some sort. And sometimes we do keep going back there. But as long as we leave God and say, oh, by the power of God, I'll never do that again. That's forsaking. And, and, and you may do it again. But you just keep going back until, until God gives you, helps you to have the victory. Psalm 32, 5 and 7 say this. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou favorest the iniquity of my sin. I'm sorry, forgottest the iniquity of my sin. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. We take sin and we hide it. Adam and Eve hid themselves and their sin from God. And we take our sins and we want to hide it and act like eh, we never committed it. And we, t and we take the hiding, the hiding, uh, God says, look, you're hiding your sin when you're supposed to be hiding in me. You're supposed to be high. I am your refuge. I am your <coughs> strong tower. I am your fortress. And I will fight for you. And I will defend you. And I will meet your needs. And I will. And I will. And I will. When you are in me. When you have, when you have found your hiding place in me. Hiding from what? Hiding from the world. Hiding from the temptations of the world. Hiding from the evil one. Hide. No, we run to God and we hide in God. Yet we as humans... With a sinful nature, we flip that. Instead of hiding in God, we hide our sin from God. And we, we can't do that, but it is what we attempt to do. C, A was Adam and Eve ran from the presence of God, and that's what sin will do. It'll, call, it'll break your relationship, and, uh, and it will cause you to walk away. B, Adam and Eve hid themselves and their sin from God, the great cover-up. They sowed leaves, uh, you know, fig, fig tree leaves, uh, and, and as, as to cover their nakedness. But we know that God, when God came on the scene, he says, that's, uh, that's not how this works. You'll never be able to cover yourself with leaves that you made together. He says, no, I'm going to kill. I'm going to kill an animal or maybe two. And he made them skins to cover from the animal skins. That became their clothes. That pictures Jesus Christ because the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. And God says, no, the works that you did in sewing together these fig leaves, that's all you. And that's your answer. That's your solution. He said, but that's not mine. And you'll go to hell with that one. And uh, let me show you what the solution is. And 
uh, and, and it's uh, the first promise of the Redeemer is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I'll read that for you. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He's speaking to the, to the serpent now. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. There are those that say that bruising the heel of Christ was on Calvary when, when Christ died for our sins. But then when, on Calvary when uh, Christ died for our sins, he crushed death. He threw death. He defeated death. So the fig leaves were no good because it was man's idea, man's, and, and, and there's no blood involved. It's the, it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. It's the blood of Christ that the high priest went in once a year into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. He went into the Holy of Holies. They tied a rope around. He had, he had bells on the bottom of his, his, uh, his garment. And they tied a rope around his foot, and they would listen outside of the Holy of Holies. He was the only one allowed in there, the high priest. And if they heard the bells stop jingling, they knew that he was dead. They knew that God had killed him, and they would pull him out by his foot because they couldn't go in there and get him. He would go in once a year. He had to have his sins confessed up to date before walking, in, before walking in front of God Almighty who was there hovering over the mercy seat. He would sprinkle blood from the land that was slain uh, and he would take that blood and sprinkle it. It was a covering. It was a covering. The blood, the red, the rich red crimson blood of Christ covered our sins. And for that year, that was for the sins of Israel. Covered, that's what the sprinkling of the blood is about. It's a big deal. Adam, C, Adam and Eve blamed someone else. Uh, verse 11, and he said, we're told, now, who told thee, God said to them, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, what did the man say? Immediately. <laughs> That's what he said. He, he actually said, the woman that you gave me. <laughs> You're in this too. You're in this too. And I think that's fear just scratching for a bailout. But he actually blames God along with Eve. The woman, the woman, the woman that you gave me, she sinned. She's the one that, she started all this. Blame. And then what does a woman do? Pointing at who? Serpent. It was just, it, look, it was the, you know, hey, everybody's wrong, but somehow I got to, you know, gotta, gotta, I got to get this off of me, Adam, Eve says. Repentance is not possible when we refuse to acknowledge our transgressions. Adam and Eve both blame somebody else. For their, their sin, for their downfall. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, my, and mine iniquity have I not hid. Instead of uh, he that hideth his sin shall not prosper, this is the exact opposite. It's bringing our sins to God and saying, I'm a wreck, and, and I'm guilty, and and I can't wait another minute. I have got to get this sin confessed. I've got to get things right between you and I again. And, and, and here they are. List them off. And, and, and I'm sorry for each one. And, and I broke your law and I know that. And I lay myself at the mercy of the court. And, and I, ask for you, I ask for you, please be merciful and gracious to me at this time and, and just forgive me. And I'm gonna, I want to start over. I mean, that's what, that's what we do. I'm going to start over. And, and through the power and the grace of God, I'll, I'll have better success, you know, today and tomorrow. Uh, it is, it is acknowledgement. It's the acknowledging of our sin. It's not the blame game. 
Okay? When we acknowledge our sin and confess our sin, then God forgives our sin. The word acknowledge in this verse simply means to make something known. God already knows it, but He wants to know that we know it. God already knows it, but He wants to know that we know it and, and, and are in agreement. For the Christian who hates sin, sin is constantly before him. Here you go, 51 3. Psalm 51 3. Uh, for I acknowledge, and this is written by David here after the sin with Bathsheba. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. The ever before me means constantly before me. And for, a, and for the person who just hates uh, breaking the law of God and offending God and disappointing God and, and, and uh, you know, for that person whose sin is a big deal, it's ever in front of him. David said, my sin is ever before me. It, I mean, I can't get away from it. He's the king. But until we take it to God and can acknowledge it and confess it, then we can, then, then God will take it and forgive it, and then we can walk away from it. But, from to, but until we get to that point, our sin is ever, for the person that cares now, our sin is ever before us. It's like everywhere I turn, I see it. Everywhere I, every thought I think, I'm thinking about it. And, and I got to get this, I got to get to God. And I got to get things right with God. I'll tell you, folks, there are times when I sin that, it, and, and, and I confess right now. <laughs> I don't wait if, if, if I'm able. I mean, I'll confess as I'm walking. God, I just thought this crazy thought and this horrible thought, and and uh, God forgive me of that, you know. And I mean, let's get it, let's get it out there and acknowledge it, and 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 bring it to God and get back on the same page with God, instead of being like a hey, Adam and Eve who blame, and that's what we do. Well, I lost my temper because, you know, I got this issue with that person because. And, uh, and I'm holding a grudge against them because you wouldn't believe what they've done to me. It doesn't work. None of that works. It's a sin to hate your fellow man. It's a sin to hate your Christian brother. It's a, it's a sin to carry grudges and, and to be on edge with somebody all the time. That's not right. Okay. I'm going to stop there. Next week I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about... Ten things that God has done with our sins. I want you to be encouraged next week. Uh, what I really want us to do is wake up. This church in America as a whole is sleeping. And I believe that one of the main reasons is we just don't give a rip about our sin anymore. Yeah, you know what it is. If I confess, look, if I confess my sin... I still go to work tomorrow and earn the same wage and I still have my, you know, still got everything. Uh, and then if I don't confess my sin and acknowledge it and confess it to God, I still go to work and get paid the same wage and still have what I got. But you don't. You do physically. But you don't spiritually. You're, you're broken. And that, and that relationship with your Heavenly Father is broken. Your Father... As a judge, you understand. As the judge, you are you're free from your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is it is covered. But as a father, it has it has it has hurt your relationship, and you don't we don't know it. And because we see no change in our lifestyles, we think it doesn't matter when it does. It's of the utmost importance to hate sin. And to desire to get to God and confess our sin. To acknowledge it and confess it and to plead for His mercy and He will forgive it. And we're going to talk about that next week. We're just taking a little time out for moving forward to talk about that next week. The promise of the Redeemer. Okay, let's pray. Father, I do pray that, 
that you would help us. Hey, look, and help me. I'm not saying I'm here. I'm not saying where, that I am where I need to be either. I am challenged by this very study. I am challenged by, this, uh, by speaking this truth tonight. I'm challenged to hate my sin. I'm challenged to surrender more to the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully, sin less. We'll never be sinless. We'll never stop sinning. We know that. But we can become more mature. And we can hate sin more tomorrow than we did yesterday. Instead of becoming more tolerable of sin than we were yesterday. And that's what's happening. Believers and churches are becoming tolerant of the sinful, the sinfulness of the world. And God, help us not to go there. Help us to care and to love you so much with a love that just gets upset even to tears over our sin. And help us to get right. And you are all about that. God, help us to move toward this well, to continually grow in this way till we see Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.